to the second part of this roundtable, which is the discussion part. And as we had thought with Rohini is after having this very black picture of the statistics, which is terrible in certain respects. You see that. I mean, there are numbers which are really awful, zeros, 1%, 2%, which is <laughs> incredible low. Uh, so the, our idea was that in the second part, we go to what can we do? I mean, what can institutions do? Like you said before, um, today is, now we are at a stage where we think that institutions must take a more active role and really do things. If we have, if we continue to have an annual progression, progression of 0.2%, we'll never get anywhere. So um, what can we do? What can institutions do to go beyond these figures? Um, and I think that you already have sketched a certain number of solutions um, which, are, uh, which are important for the careers, for families also. Um, but let us start with a first um, question is, what can we do in really in order to recruit more women, how, do we, how can we really attract them? And can we go, um, do we need quotas? Do we need constraints? What do we need to have to recruit more women uh, in science jobs? Who wants to start? Before okay. we do this, maybe I just didn't realize it. Should we first ask from the audience if they want clarifications of the points that we made? I'm sorry, I, I thought of it only after you started talking. So sorry, Martina. <laughs> Questions to the presentation. Yeah, so sorry about this. Huh? Uh, I just wanted to ask, all these statistics are great eye-opener, and it is good to give statistics because they speak for themselves. So how much of these statistics are in public domain? Is there any organization which proactively works on these statistics? Because I find there are missing pieces. May I react to this? I can answer for the, your it's work. It's working. I can answer for the European level. So there is a European statistical office, Eurostat, for the Europe in general, the European Union, and uh, they are coordinating the collection of data from the different uh, countries. It's not so obvious because at the beginning, uh, for example, France would not answer to such and such question because it did not correspond to their categories, but now it has lasted for almost 20 years, so there is a readjustment. And this is available. This is on the uh, internet and so on. And the, the booklet from the, about the women scientists is uh, distributed in paper, but also on internet. Compared to 20 years ago, the statistics are more open. Uh, at the beginning, you had to, to pray somebody to give the data which were behind and so on. Now it's no, no longer like that. For for the for example in France for the universities, it's a bit complicated. They put it on on a website, but it's not so convenient. But anyway, if you really want to have them, they are public. Thanks for making this comment because from the Indian, I, I just want to react to the comment that uh, Tanushri is making. That in the Indian context, actually, I think one of the things that I would like to take home and maybe quote the ECEU example, because in India, we still have not been able to get the institutions even to put their gender distribution on the web. Even at my own institute, I have had trouble asking them to just, but you see the photographs, you see there are women, but that's not the same thing as having a number, right? And therefore, I would like actually, I mean, I'm glad that Tanushri has made this comment, I think for India, this is something we need to do. In India, most of the statistics we have got is either by people actually calling different institutions and getting, calling many times to get the data, which I have done at times. And secondly, from UNESCO. Yes. Our better data has come from UNESCO. And I think in India, we certainly need to, it has begun, there, was, there is a very nice report from DST, which came in 2016. And I can share that with you. It's available on DST's website, which is the first time gender has been discussed. 
There was a second. Catherine has another comment. Just a few seconds to, to, to complete this answer uh, on the situation in France. All the numbers we showed are completely public on the uh, ministry site or uh, on the on the CNRS. And for quite a while, the CNRS is doing very good analysis. In terms of granting the ESC data are completely public, but if we are talking on the French National Agency for Research, there is just zero. Uh, so apparently they did recently a gender analysis, but which is not uh, public. I did it was uh, was I was uh, taking care of the life sciences at this agency, and for example in biology, uh, for the young scientists, or so the same than uh, the. Um, and the, the ESC, there was much more women. We were at 38, something like that, grantees in life sciences. So it was much better, but these data were never uh, on the web. So I just want to uh, second uh, what uh, my colleague from uh, Bangalore, IISC, Rohini, said. So it's the, the very fact that you should keep the data transparent, available, and available for analysis itself is a new thing that's happening. So the data itself is incomplete in many places. And I cannot imagine for the life of me why leading institutions of the world, in whether it's France or Germany, are not cognizant. First, you need the data to be able to think where is it that you need to act. Uh, so the data itself is very, very porous. Too much fluctuation, small numbers, and uh, then what do you do about fixing that small number errors, which we've discussed in many ways? Um, and I want to take up another point that uh, Catherine mentioned. It's a great idea that wherever we are in selection committees and granting committees, et cetera, we implement that rule of maintaining the gender ratio mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the applicant pool. I think that's an actionable, doable thing because many of us do sit in such panels. So we can ask for evidence of number of grantees who are men, number who are women, number of applicants who are men, and number of applicants which are women, and put out mechanisms to actually help them in a second round or a third round. If it requires revision, so be it. So you, they can be mentored through that cycle to reach a success percentage which is fair. Thank you. May I add here, because one of the things that indeed is correct, that if there is the mismatch of the kind that you pointed out, mentoring would really help. But the other thing that I find, for example, I did once upon a time an exercise for the academies. And I asked the question, when you are nominated to academy, I found that the chance of selection was independent of gender, more or less. Except that there were not many women being nominated. So the question also comes that sometimes you have to sensitize people, and these are men whom you have to sensitize because they are bigger in number, that the very fact that you have to be equitable, that when you nominate a man, a woman with the same credentials, do you nominate her also? That's a question that we have to bring it to our colleagues. So. That's another important point that at least I have faced in my life. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me I add, just want it's to true that yeah. statistics, uh, sorry, uh, it's true that statistics has to be done and in real time because the, the panel itself has to see the numbers it, wor it yes. the numbers it works on. So you don't have to do it afterwards, you have to do it during the meeting. Uh, you have to know how many candidates at the beginning of the meeting and how many grantees at the end of the meeting. And so it, has, it had really has to be in real time, uh, a real time exercise. That can really be an actionable point that comes out of our discussions, recommendations. Uh, just getting back to the data with respect to India, uh, I think that you have data currently that is being put in India with the AISH data, where you have data on enrollment, fairly recent, up to 2017-18 you have data. You have the breakup on gender, 
and across disciplines, and I think that data is put up. And even that data being put up was done through a study where we said that making an effort to put that data at the national level is not difficult if agencies that are giving grants like the UGC say that it's mandatory that this data has to be collected. So the issue with India is not the data not being available at the national level in terms of enrollment. You have a problem in terms of completion with respect to the PhD level, which is a bigger issue. But I think the problem with India is not the enrollment ratio that you have. The problem is what Rohini was talking of in terms of data at the institutional level. The variation that you have across representation, across institutions, across different disciplines in terms of different states and districts, I think that is more interesting data if you're looking at creating policies that should impact organizations. To have a national policy is at one level, but also to look at institutional-wide policy is also extremely important. So that's something that I thought I will just sort of raise it as an important marker. Finally, I would want, uh, and this is not with respect to the data, it's with respect to the larger presentation that has been happening. I think when one is looking at data and numbers, it's extremely important to recognize that numbers alone do not tell you the story. Because the numbers that you have are numbers on which perhaps we can look at policy interventions, but that is not sufficient. It is extremely important to involve people who are in the science and technology studies because it's a different discipline. There's a nature in which the data appears. And the qualitative data that you require for which then you generate numbers to make policy interventions is extremely important. And without understanding the sociology of science, it's going to be extremely difficult if you're looking at putting policy implications that would really address the question of gender equality. And I think it is important scientists and social scientists start working together when you're looking at studies that you need to generate data both at the national level and also across countries. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to add something for CNR as well. We actually have a very precise report. It's an annual report where you have really the percentage of uh, women applying, women selected, women recruited, promoted. And uh, this is a, a big report to about 200 pages, but it's very important to, to assess this data and to show our evolution over 10 years, sometimes to do some forecasting, and if you see that if, uh, well, more women will, will retire in the coming years, uh, the percentage will go down. So this is very, it's important. It's, I would say you have to rely on this data before you start doing a gender and equality policies. It's not uh, the aim as such to have a nice data, but you cannot do anything because sometimes it's, tr it's tricky and uh, you really have to be careful and to, to do different uh, merger of, of data. But it's, it's essential, I would say. And uh, it's strange because we have more or less the same leaky pipeline the percentage India France is uh, starting and at the bachelor to, uh, until uh, well senior researcher it's more or less the same. Maybe you don't have very reliable data for all fields and all universities, but it's more or less the same. But then you have to really go into the detail. Well, thank you very much. Hello. Yes. I, one concept, you know, the statistics are clear. I think there is nothing to say again that uh, in every country with this kind of uh, results that the change are not coming up. But we have to take into account that the statistics are a large number, but all the decisions which have been made are made by a large number of jury which are treating a small numbers. So what you have to intervene, what you have to make something significant is a kind of discrimination in the small jury. When you have two or three or zero or one uh, laureate, each time you know, you are in face of this situation where you can make comparison very easy. And so if you are not using the word positive discrimination and the action with this small 
ju the, the, the jury, which are numerous, and the small number which is given to the jury to decide about, if you have not this positive discrimination, I think you will not be succeed in changing the current and the flow of uh, success for having women in science. Yeah, I think I um, agree with the point made there that the policies have to be in place, of course, but policies have to be well thought through. Because I can see one policy of the India government that we have, which I don't think uh, many of us will agree, has, uh, I don't think it has worked well uh, quite a bit. Uh, for example, uh, the, the childcare leave, which is an 18 month leave I, for the French uh, colleagues, it's an 18 month leave which a woman, a mother, uh, a woman, um, uh, of course a mother because it's for childcare, uh, will get uh, till the child attains an age of 18. And it is only for women, of course in the government, those who are in the government organizations, not in the private organizations, but in government organizations, I have seen this, uh, this uh, policy to be misused in multiple ways. Misused by women employees, they don't need that leave, yet they take it because they have it. That is one way of misuse. Uh, the second misuse is the family pressure which comes on to the women because uh, the woman is, the mother is expected to take that leave whether she likes it or not, is expected to, I mean there are very few women who can fight that pressure. So uh, so that, is, that was uh, put in place with all good intention but didn't work out well. And the, from the company or from the organization's point of view, uh, when it recruits, uh, it cannot afford to have a person missing in action for 18 months. And therefore, would be would be thinking twice, thrice before recruiting a person who has that um, advantage. I mean, so whether that is really an advantage, whether that was really a good policy or not, uh, is uh, questionable. May I? Yes. May, may I add here? Actually, yes. So that is, uh, it yeah. should be gender neutral. Yeah. Even the father should be able I, I to get that. I completely agree with you. Yeah. And I would like to say is that I'm sorry to say this, not involving women. Child shared responsibility no. of raising the child. No. It doesn't matter whether it's a man no. or the woman. Now this That's is a reflection, <laughs> Usha. This is a reflection how a policy that has been put in place mainly by men. Yes, I'm sorry to say this that this is a with all good intentions, but mainly by men. See, that this is the unconscious bias that I want to bring, because the second point is not just this policy, but the second point is that at least in India very good intentions and very good thing that there have been a large number of play, uh, policies for re-entry yes. and now we think we have done everything that we could do for the women because we think that oh, we give them the way to come back but why should we not think of ways that they do not have to take a break that we are not even thinking and I personally I as a scientist and I have said this on many fora and I would actually like opinions of the audience, so I'm putting it here, is that I find that this is the biggest unconscious bias that has been present, where we have thought that giving flexi time, giving a lot of childcare leave would solve all the problems of the women. But that is not the problem. The problem is the attitudes. <coughs> Uh, Ma'am, ma uh, we just wanted to inform you, update you actually, uh, DST is going to start new initiative, it's, uh, it will be a big initiative for meritorious girls from the school level, six class six till the contractual position, so it is in documentation form, so maybe by next year it will come out in India. And there's also, I, ca I can maybe make a comment uh, to that, and it's also uh, in a, f a French, an, an actual topic, because there has been a call which has been published just two days ago in a larger newspaper. The idea would be to, to, make, um, to make a leave at, at, at the birth of a child, to make the, lease for the, the leave for the father obligatory. I mean, if, if man would have the same career uh, pause as women would have, then careers could be much more similar. If man at the birth of a child, would, that would be good for the child. 
I mean, if, if the father would stay home for three months and just maybe not 18, but maybe three months. And so if there would be three months and three months for father and for mother and for father, would that solve the problem? Maybe not, but but I can I, I can make uh, just one comment I saw in my uh, German young colleague they already have the shift on all uh, young men that who I know in in Germany they are taking two or three months parental leave yeah coming coming back to this issue of leave since we discussed I mean in globally there are different set of regulations for I mean think depending on requirement so there is some bit of physiological requirement for some period. But otherwise, you know, it is not only affecting the recruitment in critical areas, where definitely the panel will think about then when they have a candidate, I mean, how will it work? The other thing is that it is affecting the career of the students and PhDs and because of this issue. Because since they have it and they have to, and if themselves as well as family and the husband, so because now they have that option, other people just wash their hands of the responsibility. But I don't, We being in government, we don't like to or we are sometimes worried to raise such issue because we, this has come up as for the women organizations. There may be opposition if we say, but I think it, ha it can be really modified until what age of child it is required and all those things. Exactly, exactly. No, in fact, in fact, one of the things I would like to ask my French colleagues also, uh, since they said that they have a similar issue, is that one of the ways in which I have personally thought that uh, taking this break, let's come back to the break in the career, what can be made easier is to make flexible postdoctoral positions. Because most of the time, very often in India, at least you get your children because the time is running out, you have them when you are still a postdoc. So, are there, and at least in theoretical physics uh, and ICTP, they have started thinking of this, for example. That you say, if I'm going to have a child, please extend my postdoctoral position instead of two years to three years. I take a break of three or four months, mm -hmm. and then I come back, and I know a place where I can come back to. Mm -hmm. Not that I have to apply for my next postdoc mm -hmm. when I have taken this break of six months. So I would actually like to know whether such a scheme is there in Europe and right. so, whether so it would work. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, about the maternity leave, not the long break. Uh, it's not so old that the uh, grants are postponed by the duration. They are. Uh, okay. They were not always. Now they are. Now, for the long breaks, uh, in my view, there is another problem which is related to the way uh, the judgments are made in the committees. If you look to age factors or things like that, you have to add up a number of publications. For people that have he, has had a break, it would be much better to ask the candidate to choose her three best publications or something like that, not to be quantitative, but to shift to qualitative anyway. What uh, the situation, uh, whatever it is in uh, different countries, you have to shift to qualitative, otherwise there is no solution. And, and, and which would, would be a gender neutral uh, 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 um, criterion. Okay, uh, about the people that are in the committees, there should be, uh, of course, they should see the data corresponding to their discipline and last year and just now, but they should be trained also. And all that will only work if there is a political will at the top. Because you, anyway, there, people uh, don't like changes, so there will be a resistance to any change, including a gender change. So if there is not a strong will, 
It will never work. It will never work. But, but right now you actually uh, have that the grant is automatically prolongated. Uh, yes. We have a last question. No, just for... for, uh, I have a comment. I have a comment. Listen to me, women. I have a comment. I have seen in committee where there are a lot of women, and women are very hard with women. And this is really a question for me. What, why, what what are the mechanisms, and how can we help? to do something. But but that's a, a it's a common thing that we have uh, considered and uh, we have seen in many things that there are many women who say it was tough for me so it has to be tough for the others because we our our we tend to reproduce the same schemes this is why also we tend to to recruit it's not the same excuse. people but it's I then we agree. need a political I mean clear I completely rules. agree and we so, need something even for us. Uh, I, I completely agree. agree. Can, can I just add a last comment? Uh, so that's related to the title of my talk. I mean, I, I haven't. Uh, so when so in India, what I see is that there's a lot of goodwill from people that oh, we have to help women. You know, they can take they they so that they can work flexible hours. They can take childcare leave and. So this is so we are trying to uh, help them in a way, but yeah, patron. Yeah, I, I was not using that word, but what I feel is that what about about changing attitude and this bias we are talking about. So that's why I use the term diversity. I mean, why can't we promotion this idea that it is not about you know uh, helping women? It's about so yeah, it's about helping science. That's right because when you have so much participation from diverse groups, it's actually helping your discipline. You want, yeah. So I think this this idea, if we can champion, then automatically everything goes. She has been raising her hand for a very long time. The fact that uh, that even in France, a lot of people, when they have uh, okay. to make a decision for postdoc, if they are a male and a female. Uh, often in their mind, it becomes a fact that ho oh, oh, If she fall pregnant during uh, the postdoc, she will have to stop because I am chemist. So she will have to stop to enter in the lab to do experiment. That's the rule. So imagine you take a woman, even if she is still here, but she cannot work. Of course, she will continue to be paid because she is not during is uh, is part of the living. But she will have to leave. She cannot enter in the lab anymore in the chemicals uh, to do chemicals experiment. So when you think about it, of course you take the. Uh, of course, not me, but <laughs> of course a lot of people will think, okay, it's uh, better to take the mail. Yeah, so I think that is a point for the leaking for PhD <coughs> to postdoc. I, I think it's it's even worse now in France than it was before. Before, when you got a grant with a salary for a postdoc, if you choose a woman, okay, she had a child and she took the maternity leaves. Mm. The salary during the leaves was paid by the social security and you could get the money back as a group leader to pay this woman Mm. a longer time afterwards. And now it recently changed, even at the CNRS, and you cannot get the money back. At the CNRS, but at INSEAM and at the university, the rules change, you cannot get the money back. Okay. This, is, this is extremely pertinent, even at the graduate school. We'll put it so in the, the list. Graduate school, uh, <laughs> five years Okay, uh, I, I'm very sorry, but this is a very good discussion. So I, I, I pro- anyway, the, this workshop lasts two days, and I really encourage you to continue this discussion. And in the immediate thing, I, we will dis- we will continue the discussion through lunch, uh, and there will be another roundtable this afternoon, the next roundtable um, uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow. So um, please go on discussing all these the things, and let us first. Th- Thank all our speakers in the round table. Oh. Rohini wants to say last word.
I want to have the last word. One thing is that I want to want to thank the audience for this very active participation. But I have one request that I think something very concrete has emerged in these discussions. One very concrete suggestion about in any selection striving to keep the percentage. The second is, though it's applicable to India, only about the reasonableness of policies that are being put, how to influence that. And the third, not the least, seems to be to me the flexibility in the postdoctoral or student PhD positions. So I would like to, for myself, summarize that these seem, seem to be the main points that have emerged in this discussion. But if any of you can think of some other points, please come to give them to us so that we will give them to the coordinators to have them at the last discussion. Thank you very much.